Secretary of Administration. Uh, I am the uh, chair by statute uh, of the Clean Water Board, and the uh, statutory function of the Clean Water Board is to um, allocate the Clean Water Fund dollars and any capital dollars that have been appropriated by the legislature towards clean water projects, uh, and is a robust one-year process that we follow, um, and this is uh, the first public hearing we've had, um, and I'm really glad we did because there's a good turnout and we want to hear from the public about the draft budget. Um, the draft budget is uh, $32.9 million that's within the jurisdiction of the, the Clean Water Board. And I, I know folks have asked why is it only 32.9 when we've been saying we've got about 50 million allocated. Um, uh, to, to allocate and uh, dedicated to clean water projects. And so the statute um, gives the Clean Water Board authority only over only two pieces of our clean water funding. The Clean Water Fund itself and the capital uh, dollars that are allocated to clean water projects. The rest of the money is appropriated uh, through the normal um, state appropriation process to agencies and departments who um, engage in clean water work. I'll just briefly um, introduce the board to you today, uh, and then we can get started. Um, the run of show will be, we're going to have a presentation by the Clean Water Initiative uh, staff and the departments um, and agencies that do clean water projects to give you an overview of the, the, um, the programs that they support with clean water dollars. And then we will, um, open it up for a few questions specific to that presentation. We have a lot of people we want to fit in today. We have a sign-in sheet and we will ask folks to comment. Um, limit your comments please to five minutes so everyone has um, the same amount of time to speak. Uh, and if you haven't signed up to speak, please do so because we're going to um, work off of that sheet and anyone who is uh, participating online will be given an opportunity to speak through our wonderful Sphinx phone here. Um, and we'll alternate someone who, someone who is present here and anyone on the phone, so everybody has an opportunity. Um, so we will start with introductions. This is Jim Giffen, who is a public member of the board appointed by Governor Scott. This is Secretary Joe Flynn, the Secretary of the Agency of Transportation, Secretary Moore. Um, the Secretary of the uh, Agency of Natural Resources, Secretary Kevitz, who is the Secretary of the Agency of Agriculture, and Chad Tyler, who is a public member appointed by the board. Uh, we have a great turnout today. We have uh, two members who could not make it, but this is a working meeting. We did not need a quorum, and it's great that everybody made it here to personally hear from the public. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Emily to introduce herself and the staff and tee up the presentation. Where would you like us? Um, you're right where you are. Okay. I'm just going to do it from back here. Sorry for the awkward shoes. Uh, so understanding that there may be some participants here today who this may be their first time coming to a Clean Water Board public meeting, wanted to share a little bit of background to set the stage on the Clean Water Board, the Clean Water Budget process, and why we're all gathered here today. And after I wrap this quick presentation up, we're going to be moving through the different line items of the draft state fiscal year 21 budget. And different uh, staff from each of those agencies will be sharing a brief overview of the line items, and then we'll open it up for public comment. Okay, so the Clean Water Fund is, was established under Act 64 of 2015, and it established a specific funding source for clean water improvement work in the state of Vermont targeting nutrient and sediment pollution primarily uh, that washes into the state waters either through a wastewater treatment facility or a stormwater system, or it could be at non-point sources of pollution which is driven by rain, runoff, and snow melt. And these funds are dispersed through a budget process annually that has multiple opportunities for public participation 
and we allocate those funds across all of the different land use sectors, uh, whether it's agriculture, developed lands like hard surfaces, parking lots and roads, natural resource restoration, which improves water quality and mitigates non-point source pollution, as well as wastewater improvements. And in addition to all these water quality benefits, these projects also provide other co-benefits like public health and safety and flood resiliency. They enhance our recreation opportunities and are very good for Vermont's economy. The Clean Water Board is the statutory entity that administers the Clean Water Fund. And the Clean Water Board consists of the agency secretary of administration, agriculture, food and markets, natural <coughs> resources, commerce, community development, transportation. And a few years, or a couple years ago, uh, the legislature added four public members to be appointed to the Clean Water Board to integrate some more public participation into the process. Uh, so we have those members here today. And each year, the Clean Water Board comes together following a public process to be able to develop its annual budget and how these funds are administered. This year, we are working right now on the state fiscal year 2021 budget. So this will be effective July 1st of next year of 2020 and go through June 30th of 2021. Uh, we have worked with Department of Taxes to determine what the anticipated revenues are for these funding sources that flow into the Clean Water Fund. And our funding target for the Clean Water Fund in state fiscal year 19 <coughs> is approximately $19 million. And in addition to that, $13.9 million have been allocated through the capital bill process at the state legislature to also support this work. And by statute, the Clean Water Board makes the recommendations for these two funding sources, which in fiscal year 21 will total almost $33 million. And as uh, Secretary Young mentioned, in addition to these funding sources, we're also leveraging funds through the transportation bill, other federal funds, and the appropriations bill that helps to bring together the whole portfolio of clean water funding. And this is a quick overview, apologies for the small print, of, of our budget process. There is a less detailed version of it on the fact sheet in your materials. On the right hand side, you'll see a process chart right here. Uh, this is a little bit more detailed version. So the Clean Water Board had its first meeting under this budget process in June. And the Clean Water Board at that meeting finalized last year's budget to begin implementation this year. And they also looked at uh, a draft budget recommendation that was developed by agency staff based on cost estimates for clean water work in the state of Vermont. And they approved that draft budget, posted it for public comment. It has been out for public comment since July 22nd, and it will be posted until September 6th. And there is an online questionnaire that's also included in your materials that uh, is available for providing written comments and also weighing in proportionately how the state should be allocating these funds. Uh, once that public comment period closes, uh, we will be integrating the recommendations and comments from this public hearing with the results of this online questionnaire into a package of public comment that will be presented to the Clean Water Board for their review. The Clean Water Board will meet in October. The exact meeting time has not yet been set, but we will be advertising that through our email list serve. If you haven't signed up yet, I encourage you to do so. Um, and then the Clean Water Board will finalize its budget recommendation incorporating <coughs> the public comment um, and then submit their recommendation to the administration to incorporate into the state budget and it will go through a public legislative process to finalize and by the time we come out of the next legislative session we will have a final fiscal year 21 budget that the agencies will begin to implement. Okay. So that is the presentation of some background, and now we're going to switch gears. If you will go into uh, your meeting materials, you will find uh, line item descriptions of each of the fiscal year 21 uh, Here on page eight is the budget, the draft state fiscal year 21 budget that has been posted on our website and approved by the Clean Water Board for public comment. 
And now we're going to run through each of those line items by agency, and there are more detailed descriptions available also in your meeting packet. So first you'll see the table of the roll-up of the 21 budget, and then following that are the detailed line item descriptions that we're going to walk you through now so that you have a chance to learn a little bit more about how these funds are going to be used, what types of projects they'll support, and then we can shift gears into the public comment period. So mm -hmm. first up, we have Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Larry DiPietro is going to be uh, providing an overview of their programs. Do you want to hold questions to the end, or just yes, yes please? Okay. Great. Thank you, Brad. So talk to you all and everyone else. So I'm Laura DiPietro at the Agency of Agriculture, um, in charge of the water quality programming. And at the Agency of Agriculture, mostly what we do is regulatory work with farmers to inspect them to identify problems. When we identify problems or people voluntarily come up and identify a problem on their own, we then have programs and the statutory setup is that the cost is not to be borne by the farmer solely, it is the citizens to protect the water in the state of Vermont, and hence the programs that exist at the Agency of Agriculture to then help people implement projects. So that's the structure of, of what we do and, and how we do it. The first line item there is the Ag Conservation um, Assistance Program, and that is essentially Farmers need some technical assistance in the field to help them as they try and do innovation, right? So ag agronomy and work in the field, I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes in the past where you see a lot more cover cropping, um, no-till practices, things like that. Having folks, <coughs> typically this is a, a great deal of this is UVM Extension and the Pulteney Meadowy Conservation District, having staff to work with farmers directly to do that work. Um, those people are also, because they have other sources that support them, are able to get grants and have other programming that then becomes accessible to the farmers. So, for instance, a lot of these groups have actually helped facilitate getting equipment and moving equipment for these farmers and doing sampling and testing so that they can understand the impacts of the practices and the changes that they've made and, and how that goes. So, that program there is, um, is solely directed at that. And then the water quality grants to partners and farmers in previous Clean Water Fund budgets, you will have noticed there were two different line items. One was money to partners and one was money to farmers. These have sort of been merged together uh, because of how just the grant and opportunities work. Um, sometimes, for instance, we would give money to a partner who would then move that money to a farmer. So putting it in one bucket allows us to have that ability to just give one grant instead of two grants to folks. So it limits the um, administrative overhead. But essentially, that is a wide bucket, right? That, that's, you know, other than that, the next one's operating, we'll talk about. Um, this is the bulk of where the clean water funding in the line items to the Agency of Agriculture to facilitate and move out to partners and farmers exist. And in the back, you'll see there's a lot of different things. There's capital money and there's, there's obviously clean water fund money into it. Um, and so essentially, you know, we use the capital money to help with, with brick and mortar and, and more fixed steel or other type of uh, longer term investments and then we use the non-capital funds to do a lot of the education, outreach, project development, those kinds of things. Um, but more specifically, on the capital fund side here, you know, our biggest program is our best management practice program. So that's the program that essentially helps put infrastructure on the ground. So we go out to a farm, we identify a problem, we realize you need some fix. That fix comes through that program. Um, and it's uh, developed with our engineers or outside engineering services. Sometimes that program can actually pay to help outside. So if it's a very risky project, um, we might want a private engineer coming in to help do that project um, for stability, to make sure that it's, it's well designed. Not that we don't have bad engineers, but uh, sometimes liability is, in, in, is put into that space. Um, conservation <laughs> Reserve Enhancement Program, so that's another program that we have that essentially it's a long-term lease on a farm to take land out of agricultural production and put it in a more conservation use. Uh, typically they're seeding it down to grass or putting it into trees. And so in the state of Vermont, that program's been around for a while and we're actually starting to see some of the projects re-enroll for these longer-term investments. Um, one thing we are going to do in that space in the near term is we've actually been able to work with DC and uh, Lake Champlain Basin Program to get some resources to bring on another staff person. And that program is mostly federally supported. It's four federal dollars to one state dollar. And having another staff person that's predominantly <coughs> supported with federal funding um, is going to allow us to even bring more opportunity to get more projects and expand the scope of work uh, that we are able to pull more dollars from the feds because they have other program options that we just haven't tapped into yet. So that's our plan into the future is to do that. 
Um, grass waterway filter strip program, essentially through the years you've heard of critical source area probably, we've been able to even refine those maps more and, and have grants out to partners to go on farms, identify areas that are highly sensitive and seed them down essentially and do a long term, term contract to seed that particular area down. And so that is that work, that is all um, sourced out to other folks. The districts and UVM Extension currently have contracts to do that work. Um, and then the Capital Equipment Assistance Program is a program that helps um, farmers with the investment either in the actual steel in the field, right? So putting in a lot of these conservation practices take equipment that farmers traditionally didn't have. And so helping farmers cost share that equipment so that they can get it. Helping partners who might want to facilitate sharing equipment amongst farmers to get that. Um, and then additionally, there's some innovative technology and phosphorus reduction work that can be done um, to also cost share with like infrastructure to put on the farm to actually do some of these nutrient separation uh, technologies. So that's that. Um, Ag Environmental Management Program is a new program that just started with this last legislative session. And essentially this program was born out of the fact that we're all working on water quality and uh, with feds in, in the state with these programs and sometimes you look at a farm and you look at the cost of the price tag to do the fix that's required on the farm and then you, you know for instance a simple comparison is you look at the grand list cost of that or price of that farm and the cost to fix it is more than the farm might be worth and so trying to figure out are there other alternatives and ways to shift what happens on that farm to um, make the best use environmentally and also just in, in our public good for that piece of land so we were able to get some more opportunity to do like easements um, or um, alternatives where in, in lieu of putting in all that infrastructure we use those funds to, to say perhaps you know no more annual cropland right here um, or something to that effect and pay the farmer for that lost opportunity. And then, would you like to take this seat? Oh, is it there's also a chair available right now. Yeah. 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 Um, it looks like it's yeah, that's my thing. Oh, <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> <laughs> I just have a pile of stuff around it. All right, so just a couple more programs. <laughs> Um, so on the non-capital fund side, the, um, what we do there is a lot more of the annual things that might happen. So cover cropping, the um, seeding over winter, that's something that obviously you need to do every year. And so that's the kind of practice that is funded there. We've also been able through the Lake Champlain Basin and federal fund support and also USDA been able to really put more out there in that program and, and use these funds and have some funds come to us to be able to pass through to farms. Um, cover cropping is up significantly in state in the state and it's just it's, it's a really good strong practice as well as other practices like no-till um, this year we created a new space and practice because we did have this additional money to help pay support for farmers who are maintaining grass and doing good grazing and having like at least three inches and there's other restrictions in the program but to try and foster and, and put more into that space to support those farms that want to do those activities um, and then the, the other one in here is the Ag Clean Water Initiative Program. This is our big grant program that we do out to partners and farmers. Um, that is essentially where, you, what we've tried to do is uh, several years ago kind of create block grant concepts where if you are a UVM extension or a conservation district or a watershed group or a farmer group, what you need is stability and having to be able to hire a staff who can work with farms and build relationships. And so we build these, these agreements with folks <laughs> to be multiple years. They could apply for either two or four years and to give that, that structure of like, give us a sense of your programming and give us a sense of your goals and we'll check in with you. Um, there's definitely things that flux and when there's other monies that come in, we wanna be able to use them for that and then have flexibility to create new space and programs. So we created a lot of flexibility in how we do the, this type of work to basically rely on the skills, knowledge, and abilities of the partners who are well-trained and have been doing this work for years to do it and, and report back to us and check in with us. Um, and then the last one here is this innovative method for improving water quality. You know, we're able to, to look at any of the gaps that kind of get filled. Um, stuff that comes up that it's just, it's interesting and, and there's not a, a specific program that fits for it, right? So one project I can think of, there was a project in Lake Carmi where there was an old um, space where there may have been uh, soils that were inundated with nutrients over time. And so this is the kind of resource we can come in and do a project specifically to do this, which doesn't fit any other federal or state conservation practice box, right? And so that's where we're able to do, you know, tile drain monitoring or other innovative stuff to look at it. Um, we support a lot of the edge of field monitoring that goes on in the state. We support the laboratory work that goes on it through this. So 
is where we're able to help play a, a role in facilitating other projects that are predominantly supported by others or, or fill the gaps. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Jenny Moore from Vermont Housing Conservation Corps. I can't hear the names back here. Oh, Jen. Holler? Oh, sorry. Holler. 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 First time you heard that. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Jen Holler, and I'm with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Um, if you look through the list of agencies there, you'll see that one of these things is not like the others, and that's us. We're actually not a state agency or officially part of the administration. Uh, we're a quasi-public agency that's set up much like VSAC or the Vermont Economic Development Authority. Um, but we are included in the state budget and receive state funding to do affordable housing, land conservation. Um, and we also provide um, business assistance to farm and forest enterprises. Um, and many of these activities have, um, and we've um, emphasized the water quality benefits that come out of these activities. And for that, for those reasons, it's been folded into the clean water budget. And that's why you see two line items um, for VHCB activities here. So the first one is that, um, uh, ag, ag water quality projects, and um, we use that funding to provide grants directly to farmers for infrastructure improvements on their farms um, in order to address potential runoff or um, make other improvements that are going to um, mitigate or improve um, water quality impacts. Um, the grants are up to $40,000, um, and again, those are for capital investments. And they typically support farmers and paying for project components that other state and federal programs either can't cover because that particular activity or project element is ineligible or simply because there just isn't enough funding in those programs and um, the project on that particular farm doesn't score high enough in order to be able to um, receive funding. So it's a little bit of a, a gap filler and when we administer that program we bring along with it um, some business and viability um, assistance to the farmer to help them make the assessment about um, how that project is going to fit into the overall financial viability of their farm. And let's see, just to kind of show you one quick, I mean this is not not going to do you much good from a distance, but this is just one example. It's on a conserved farm and these, um, this father and son, the name of the farm is um, Poulin and Daughters, and uh, they're a beef and maple farm. Um, and they received a water quality grant in 2017 see, to, um, through the same water funding, to install uh, manure containment structures. We visited, visited that <coughs> not too long ago, and their farm sits up above of the river. Um, they had a project that they really wanted to do to con um, contain the manure. Um, it just didn't, um, eligibility, it didn't rank high enough to get funding from other programs, but now that's in place, and being on site, you can really, I mean, it's just holding it back from, from the river, and it's all, um, slopes down so you can really see the impact that that made. So just to give you a little bit of an example of what these line items look like um, out, in the, uh, out in our communities. And then the second line item is our um, uh, land conservation and water quality project. So VHCB with this funding provides grants for the permanent conservation of land and that can be ag, although this section is for <coughs> natural resources. Um, when that's done, any surface waters, um, there's an easement that's placed on the property that lasts in perpetuity and it protects and creates break, um, larger than usual riparian buffer zones or wetland protection zones. So there are um, uh, extra water quality protections that are put in place as part of that conservation project um, in order to protect it over time. VHCB has been doing this for a number of years and just to give you a sense of the long term impact of these kind of state investments, this is. Um, Rossetti Beach and um, Colchester, some of you may be familiar with it, um, but using uh, capital funds way back in 1997, um, the local land trust purchased and saved um, this, um, it's really a public gem, there aren't that many you know, big beaches. It was slated for um, a development of 44 homes at the time, so now it's permanently conserved and it features um, mm -hmm. access, um, public access to the beach on Lake Champlain, but most important for our purposes today, is that the natural area preserves a button bush wetland that filters local storm water. And that's continuing to happen and will continue to happen over time. And there are a couple um, 
Uh, it's also critical habitat for two endangered plant species. So just to give you an example of um, how these monies get used and how um, spent now, they will continue to protect the lake um, and provide other public benefits to the state over time. So a couple other points I just wanted to make um, as you think about um, all these different activities is one is that all the money from these two line items go straight to grants. There's none of it that covers admin. And any of these projects that we as staff select and recommend to our board, that happens after a consultation process with the Agency of Agriculture and um, also with the folks at DEC about what are the water quality considerations and how should the easements be structured. So, questions later when there's time. All right, I believe I'm up next. Uh, my name's Emily Bird. I'm the Clean Water Initiative Program Manager, and I'm going to uh, tackle the Agency of Natural Resource line items with my colleague, Teresa Thomas. So I'll get started. Our first line item that is really applies to all agencies is the Innovation and Multi-Sector uh, Partner Support. And this really supports the development of innovative phosphorus reduction technologies uh, that we can begin to implement and develop across the state to solve our phosphorus and other water pollution issues. Uh, that has been administered in partnership with Agency of Agriculture through the Phosphorus Innovation Challenge. Uh, it's really a cross the land use sector uh, initiative. We also are investing some of these innovation funds into development of programs related to the Vermont Clean Water Service Delivery Act, or Act 76, that just passed this past legislative session, really developing tools to be able to better prioritize and develop clean water projects so that we're investing in the most cost-effective projects, and to enhance our ability to do the analysis of the uh, anticipated pollutant <coughs> reductions associated with these projects so we can plan for the most cost-effective investments. And then the third category under this innovation line, up, line item is partner support, helping to develop our partners' capacities to really work out in the field with different landowners and operators to develop and implement clean water projects. Similar to what Laura had described, uh, these entities need funding to support their capacity to do this great work, and they're really the champions of these projects on the ground. The next line item, number seven, is related to natural resource restoration. So this may include uh, river and floodplain restoration, which also has the co-benefit of building flood resiliency, uh, wetland restoration, uh, forest restoration work, and lakeshore restoration. And it also includes some protection, such as river corridor easements. And really, natural infrastructure is one of the most cost-effective approaches to addressing our water quality problems and this funding really helps to leverage that support to be able to protect and restore our natural infrastructure. Uh, the next slide item, number eight, is related to lakes and crisis funding and currently the state of Vermont has one lake, designated lake in crisis, Lake Carmi, and this allocates about $50,000 a year uh, specifically to implement the Lake Carmi Lake in Crisis Response Plan. Uh, these funds have been used to help support and leverage funding to implement an aerator, as well as some enhanced monitoring to study the effects and make sure it's working, and a lot of planning and development work related to uh, the agricultural sector and I believe we have plans for the current year's funding to help support some manure injection technology that will help reduce the manure uh, surface runoff. Uh, and so every, whenever there is a new lake in crisis, hopefully there aren't many uh, established by statute, uh, this funding source will help to respond to that immediate uh, response plan and implementation plan. Line nine is Forestry Skitter Bridge Program, and this helps uh, loggers and forest operators to be able to purchase and construct portable skitter bridges, which is used to transport their equipment over stream crossings. So rather than dragging the equipment through a stream crossing, they're able to uh, easily lay it down and cross without causing additional erosion. This has been a great program that we've been supporting in partnership with Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Uh, and it's been a continuous investment in really gaining that capacity to implement those best practices for forestry. The next line item is a new one this year. Uh, this is adapting the municipal road standards for ANR, Agency of Natural Resource Trail and Road Networks. 
So in the state of Vermont, we have the municipal roads general permit that requires municipalities to bring their roads up to standards for water quality if they are in close proximity to water bodies. And to uh, lead by example and also really start to prioritize this work, uh, we are this year investing in a comprehensive assessment of the Agency of Natural Resources road and trail networks with our sister departments, Fish and Wildlife and Forest Parks and Recreation. And the results of that assessment will help to produce a prioritized list of projects that will help to stabilize erosion issues along those trail and road networks. And then we will be using some of these funds to help to implement that work. Uh, the next line item is related to the municipal roads general permit. These funds uh, under line 11. Uh, this is an ongoing program that we've, we're on the third year now of implementing and it disperses funds to all municipalities that are required to comply with the municipal roads general permit. If they are willing to participate, they will receive an allocation of funds that's dispersed based on a formula of road miles and the requirement is to bring roads that do not meet the standards into full compliance. Uh, and then we're partnering with the regional planning commissions to implement that program and they provide technical assistance to municipalities and help with reporting. Uh, the next line item, number 13, is municipal stormwater project planning and implementation. Uh, municipalities are one of our strongest partners to implement practices that help to slow, absorb, infiltrate, and treat non-point source pollution and stormwater pollution from our developed lands. Uh, and th this funding source is specifically targeting the construction, development, planning of best management practices to control storm water. And then finally, for me, I believe, uh, number 17 is the wastewater treatment facility operator support. And this is an ongoing program that we work with uh, experts in wastewater treatment optimization to help provide technical assistance and education and outreach to wastewater treatment facility operators so that they can plan to implement lower cost optimizations to their facilities, uh, which are much more cost effective than a larger upgrade. Uh, and now I'm going to pass it to Teresa Thomas, who will share information about the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and Municipal Pollution Control Grants. All right, hi guys. Um, so my part is relatively short, so I manage the Clean Water and Drinking Water State Revolving Fund uh, it's a grant that we get from EPA that has to be matched with state dollars on a five to one ratio. So this year, uh, that line item related to the Clean Water SRF will fund the state portion of getting the grant. So that's largely used for our municipalities that do wastewater treatment facility upgrades, CSO work. So if you live in a community and you're asked to vote yes or no to a bond vote for wastewater infrastructure, there's a pretty good chance it's getting funded from the Clean Water SRF. Um, it's a program that's been around for 30 plus years, so um, happy to explain more if you need, but that is what that line is referring to. Um, the next line um, refers to municipal pollution control grants, and these are uh, grants that have also been around for a number of years. They are used essentially to offset, typically used to offset um, loan dollars under the Clean Water SRF, so it sort of <coughs> complements the line above it. Um, traditionally, municipal pollution control grants were available based on categories, so you got a certain dollar amount of grant based on the type of project that you had. This uh, year, we are changing to a formula based on priorities set by the legislature back in uh, 2017, maybe. Um, so that's what that line item is about. So we get applications in from communities. We look at a variety of factors, including affordability, water resources impacts, um, the types of program or projects that they are um, proposing, and then they are um, awarded a percent um, as a grant. So is that good? OK. All right, thank you. Let's have you Sue Scribner from the Agency of Transportation. Good morning again, my name is Sue Scribner. I'm um, at VTrans and I head up our Municipal Assistance Bureau. And we, the line item number 12 that would come to VTrans would be for our Better Roads Program. 
That is a grant program um, that provides funding to municipalities to help them in part meet the requirements of the municipal roads general permit as well as provide funding to rectify some other problem situations on their road network that are leading to poor water quality. Um, the typical types of projects that we fund in that program are um, ditching by roads, um, crowning the roads, um, repairing cross culverts under the roads, and we also have some funding for um, slope stabilization type projects as well as upsizing of culverts. These are small dollar. The grants um, go anywhere from $8,000 up to $60,000, and municipalities are able to complete these expeditiously, generally within one state fiscal year. And um, for the amount of a uh, million dollars has been proposed to come to VTRANS, and that we might estimate might provide about a, um, 60 grants to municipalities in addition to other funding that might come through the transportation. Thank you, Sue. Next up, we have Mike Middleman from the Agency of Administration. Yep. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Middleman. Name please. Mike Middleman, I'm a budget okay. analyst with the Department of Finance and Management. Uh, we have two line items at the Agency of Administration that we administer. Uh, one is uh, line 14 for storm water utility payments. Uh, this is 125000 to five municipalities at $25,000 each were uh, instructed by, through statute to prioritize funding uh, for the uh, establishment and operation of stormwater utilities. Um, and starting at FY20, we will have five municipalities that have uh, stormwater utilities set up. And those are Williston, Colchester, South Burlington, St. Albans City, and Burlington. The other line item, um, and we're also, for, for that, that line, for line item 14, we're also uh, having level funding for FY21. We're anticipating the same number of stormwater utilities um, in FY21 as in FY20. Uh, and then our second one that we administer is line 20, which is the program audit of all of our clean water funding, which is uh, required by statute as well. We have a report due to the legislature on January 15th, 2021, um, and we have 25,000 FY20 to get the process started and the remaining 75,000 to uh, finish that audit up in FY21. Um, and really the anticipated cost is associated with hiring the right consultant. It's a very large, as you guys have probably gotten the impression, complex program that covers a lot of different sectors. So finding the right uh, contractor do this work um, is essentially what we're trying to do and why we've allotted money for this. this. Thank you, Mike. And next we have Chris Cochran from Agency of Community Commerce and Community yeah. Development. Uh, good morning, I'll be quick. Uh, my name is Chris Cochran. I work for the Division for Community Planning and Revitalization. And a lot of what our work and programs do is um, um, programs and incentives to keep our downtowns and village centers uh, strong and vital. As many of you know, our built-up areas are a major source of phosphorus pollution. However, the challenge is retrofitting stormwater treatment into these areas. There's a lot of impervious cover. And we, this, these two line items are, they leverage about $600,000 in existing program funds to municipalities to encourage them to find opportunities to sink and treat stormwater within, within their downtowns and village centers. So when they make a sidewalk in is there an opportunity to treat that stormwater on this property? Are there opportunities to plant trees to send the stormwater within the urbanized areas? Um, and I, I, um, the program, again, is targeted at our designated downtowns. There's 23 of them and our village centers, and there's about 180 of them across the state. Okay, so uh, we can open that up to questions if you want clarification on any of the presentations. So it would be helpful if I think if you perhaps stood up to ask your question um, and tell us which, which program you have the question about so we can get the right person to respond. So go ahead. Yes, my name is Nina and I'm from the Franklin, excuse me, Watershed. And my question is on line item number eight. So we're from the only lake in crisis, yet our funding is right up there with the Skidder program. 
So I'm just kind of wondering if you can explain why a lake in crisis has such low funding. Thank you. Uh, I will just clarify that the lake in crisis funding is to support the initial response whenever there is a new lake declared a lake in crisis, and that is not the limiting uh, funding for that that particular watershed or lake in crisis, that we have been investing a number of other funding sources for Lake Carmi, including $1.6 million uh, from our grant funding to support the construction of an aeration system that will help to address the phosphorus that's already built up in the Lake Carmi uh, sediments. And there have been a number of other investments through the agricultural programs, U.S. Department of Agriculture, as well as through uh, the programs that I run to help address uh, erosion and runoff issues. So while the Lake and Crisis funding is set at 50000 annually to help with some of that response as a dedicated source, there are many other funding sources and investments that are occurring for Lake Carmi. Um, and that would likely be the case for other future uh, lakes if they were established as a lake in crisis. Can I, can I clarify my question again then? Sure. So there is no specific <coughs> lake in crisis funding. We have to compete with everything else. So there is no really lake in crisis funding in this bill, correct? Because we're competing. We will compete with all these other line items, is that correct? Uh, all of our funding is administered in a competitive <coughs> process. We use tactical basin planning as the methodology for helping to identify those pollutant hotspots. So for a, a watershed, a sub-watershed like Lake Carmi, that is certainly a priority and that is a, a, a consideration when we make those funds, uh, those funding decisions as we award funds to specific projects. Uh, additionally, under Act 76, we're going to be reformatting how these funds are allocated and clean water service providers will be established to uh, administer funds based on a specific phosphorus reduction target and that will also support this better prioritization and cost effectiveness approach and as I mentioned, we are investing in those analytics to help inform those decisions as well. So while we do have a competitive process for administering these funds, uh, we certainly consider those pollutant loading hotspots and that helps us to target those areas uh, where there are the greatest problems on the landscape to focus our projects. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, James Moroni and Lester, uh, Vermont. I'm sure everyone here saw the, the auditor's report uh, a couple of weeks ago that the state is not allocating sufficient money or uh, uh, enough money to uh, agriculture, which is the easiest part of the problem to solve. Uh, according to the budget that you have up there behind you, for agriculture is getting about a third of the budget, uh, and agriculture is a half the problem. Uh, can you explain that? Sure, I, I can take a stab or answer my other um, So the, the allocations up here uh, reflect the, the dollar <coughs> value. Certainly, we know that there are cost-effective reductions to be made in agriculture. That said, there are also statutory and federal, state statute and federal obligations we have um, to do work in all sectors. <coughs> So it, it, it's not um, perhaps as straightforward as, as you may have been, um, may have read in the auditor's report in that we want to make sure we're making the most cost effective investments, but at the bot there's also um, a minimum required investment in each of the core sectors that Emily had talked about, wastewater, natural resources, restoration, developed land, stormwater, um, as well as agriculture. And so this budget attempts to balance what at sometimes could be competing priorities. The other piece is not all of the dollar. well I guess all of the dollars shown up here, not all of the dollars writ large um, are available for all types of projects. The, the one set up here that, that falls into that category is the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, uh, line 18, where we're matching federal funds. Th those dollars are, by virtue of their, their funding source at the federal level that Teresa spoke to, um, are really only available for, for wastewater and stormwater type projects. So um, there's, a, there's a balance we're trying to strike there. Certainly um, we have a significant increase, more than 10% in the funds going to agriculture in the, the, for the FY21, which is in part a reflection of the point you make that this is an area for cost-effective investment. 
Any other questions? Yes, for, for Lord Petro. Um, the, you mentioned cover crops earlier, and I'm confused on this because as we're talking about the funds that are available for agriculture cleanup, these are cover crops are primarily used to heal the ground after we do our corn harvesting. Um, Heather Darby at a UVM field day some years ago basically said that they don't work in the state of Vermont. After the, after the month of September, their effectiveness, their effectiveness drops precipitously. So what monies are we spending, public monies are we spending on cover cropping? And are we getting our money's worth out of them? Because from us on the ground, what we see by the time springtime comes around, they're not very robust. Um, and also, you could you give us a sense of what we're seeing in the additional <coughs> pesticide application because we're now cover cropping? Okay. Um, so the cover cropping certainly this last year, as an example, is a very wet, wet fall, and that does have challenges for growth, right? Um, but the standards for the state and the federal programs are geared towards getting them in early so that they can grow and be productive. And as you know, Heather Darby is doing a ton of work on looking at shorter day corn and making sure that you can still meet your needs for your animals that you have if you start growing a less, um, the longer you grow corn, obviously the more biomass it would grow, right? So you got to make sure you meet your, your minimum nutrition requirements. And um, she's done a lot of that research. And farmers have shifted in, in many of these spaces. Um, there are alternatives such as helicopter and other things to try and get them on early, high boy. Um, so I've been working in those spheres to try and, and see that. but. When done properly and able to be caught on a good year, absolutely, they're, they're incredibly beautiful in the fall. Um, so it's that balance of trying to, you know, you can't control the weather, but if you can get the practice and you can fine tune it and farmers can put it, fit it into their, their work in a way that allows them to be more efficient with it, it will improve, and we've seen that already. Um, so cover crops are, are a good practice. There's plenty of documentation to show that. Um, on the herbicide piece, um, th that is not something like as far as my area of expertise and knowledge that I could really say on a statewide basis what the change is, um, but certainly farmers were already using herbicides if they were growing conventional corn. And so using an herbicide to then deal with uh, the, the turnover of the cover crop so that you can plant again next year is a practice. There's also research and efforts going into not doing that and using other methods, um, more mechanical methods. And in certain years, again, weather dictates, and it depends on what's going on, whether the crop is able to, to respond well to that or not. <coughs> so research is continuing that area. Obviously, it costs money, it costs time, it costs energy, and, and everyone wants to get to a more efficient space. So I think everyone has the same goal of trying to look at better water quality in the end. But all of this is predicated on us growing corn, mm -hmm. right? So if we weren't growing corn, we wouldn't need to be spending all this time and money to deal, try and invent a way of making cover crops, or the high boy you talk about seeding from helicopters, that seems to me a really ludicrous way of solving this problem that is trying to grow corn in our climate, right? So if we just yeah. took the corn out of the equation, we wouldn't need cover crops, is that right? So, so I, don't, I, I can't so, speak to that because yeah. that is outside of my I think maybe that ability. would be part of your public comment that yeah. okay. you don't think that is you know, a broad priority <coughs> for, for the clean water funding. Um, thank you, Laura, for, for answering the questions. Go ahead. Uh, Cynthia Knight from Burlington, formerly of Charlotte. I learned recently that there's a connection. There's some kind of requirement for farmers' crop insurance uh, to to use the, the uh, herbicides to knock the cover crop down. Can anybody clarify that for us? Um, are, there, are they required to use this in order to get their crop insurance? The, the Farm Service Agency and other organizations typically would do that type of work of crop insurance, and so we would have to find out from them yeah. what their policy is. So that, we'll that would be a federal program, yeah. a federal USDA program. If it is the state, we don't have any crop insurance with the state, but it might be a federal program, USDA. So we need to clarify that because yeah. that requires, I mean, that has required a doubling of the use of Roundup between 2015 mm -hmm in 2016, so according to the data from the uh, Vermont Agricultural uh, um, And so, and I found that this research that indicates that, that Roundup is 18.3% phosphorus. Mm -hmm. We're using tons of it mm -hmm. on our ground. 
So, so we can, if we don't face that factor <coughs> in, in the lake crisis, we don't face it in our water quality, uh, we're, I don't believe we're going to meet our TMDL goals. So, so your all. question is whether there is a federal requirement for the use of pesticide. Um, and uh, is that something, Secretary Tuttitz, that I, your I, I agency can, could? Can, what we'll do is that's only when one piece of it. I mean, this is huge, huge. We're using okay. tons of the stuff, so. and and so. Um, okay. I'm so what we'll do with the questions that we don't have the ready answers to is we're making note of them. We will do a follow-up document, post it online with the answers that we have found to the extent we we can. Um, and then I think if there's not another specific question you have about the presentation. Um, I would ask that you save the rest of your time for the public comment period. Sure. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions about the presentation? And then we can start the public comment period, um, but we want to make sure we, we you know, get the time allowed up until 11 o'clock. So, sir, go ahead. Uh, Reed Hampton from Ferris Park. I was wondering under the <coughs> ag grants, uh, can farms get a grant for tiling and tiling installation and the tree removal that's involved in all of that? No. What they can and what we do support is research into tile drainage. So at the end of the pipe, putting in infrastructure to do monitoring. So like a sampling portal, if that makes sense. Um, but not the actual tile itself. Um, we have had conversations and there is a gap if you were to try and study above ground and below ground, so surface runoff and subsurface runoff. You would need to be able to control how that drainage is structured in order to get good monitoring sites from a statistical perspective. We have not yet invested or made that investment to, to lay a line so that we can make sure that we have watersheds that are truly paired. Um, but that is an area that could be discussed if, if there were interest. Okay, we've got uh, two more hands up, and we'll, we'll finish with those two and see if there are OFG hands up. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, Jim Shard, City of Burlington. Thank you all for your time and effort. It's much appreciated. I think my question is on line number 13. Um, all these numbers are addressing capital needs and not necessarily operation and maintenance, and that's a big um, draw on the funds for municipalities. So the Clean Water Implementation Program has been really accessible, and <coughs> municipalities have really benefited from that with um, implementing capital projects. My question is, is there any thought of perhaps upping the percent match that the state will provide municipalities in recognition of the long-term operation and maintenance costs that uh, are the municipalities need to handle. Thanks. So, do you want to speak to it? Um, sure. So, for those larger developed uh, communities, we do have a 50% match requirement. Um, that 50% match, local match requirement, can be met by also accessing the Clean Water State Revolving Fund program to help leverage uh, funding sources. Uh, but we do acknowledge the need to operate and maintain these practices. It's required by stormwater regulation. Um, and Act 76 also creates a structure for those non-regulatory projects uh, to support a partner to be able to do the operation and maintenance long term to ensure that the state investment is maintained. Um, that said, uh, we we set the state match requirements at the program level and the Clean Water Initiative program uh, that I work with, uh, we have set that match requirement and uh, it is possible that it could be adjusted as we move into the future, uh, but we would need to do an analysis in terms of the funding available, how we best leverage and cost share and the different funding sources. Um, and that is part of the equation to make sure that funds are spread out as equitable as possible across many communities. Um, and so it's part of the whole planning exercise, but we are certainly open to having the conversation with our leadership and with those municipalities to see how we can best support the great work you're doing. Thanks, James. Okay, we've got time for two more, and we will get into the public comments. And yeah, I'm time Ernest later. Wright, and I've talked to a lot of people in the different commissions and the agency, and this question is pertaining to wetlands. Uh, we all look, it's not a, how should I say, a registered cease and desist on some of our property that we were actually going to plant hemp to this year. Uh, Shannon Morris, and I don't see her here, she was saying that uh, not to use that land <laughs> until she gives us a, uh, some type of decision 
I was on the phone with it quite a while yesterday, but the question I have <coughs> is where the heck can I have the state purchase the wetland that we own? Because it's a tremendous, tremendous liability to my family and myself when we can't use our property and at the same time we got a tax bill on that derby property uh, last friday and yet our taxes went up again my question is there any money up there where the state can own that land because to me it's worth nothing and pertaining to what the state is saying that wetland should be worth thirty five forty thousand dollars an acre because that's what they made our family lose this year by not planting 15 acres of hemp on there. And that's the low price. So the question I have, can I get some of that funding where the state can own the land? We no longer want land in Vermont. It's driving a lot of us out, and we're two of them that's getting the heck out of this state because of no money that the legislature makes these laws and yet has no money expects us to spend thousands, 40 to 50,000 everybody, to bring it in compliance to wetland compliancy, that's dead wrong. So the question, can we get financing where they own this land? So I guess the question is, do any of the programs outlined in the Clean Water Budget um, provide funding for a dilemma like this? Sure, so the, the natural resources restoration line, which is line number seven, is the money we have available to purchase land like that. There are a number of factors. Obviously, the, the two or $3.2 million that's budgeted there is, is not sufficient um, for the, the types of needs you're talking about, but those are the, that is the place where those projects could apply. Generally, we're looking for areas within the landscape that are, are particularly sensitive um, or provide a, a serve as a significant source or a, excuse me, sink, buffer, or sponge. Um, to a, a receiving water, uh, whether it's a lake or a river or a stream. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go in, but that natural resources restoration money both restores um, wetlands and river corridors and other natural areas that have been um, may, may, that may have been developed at one point and could be restored to a higher function, um, as well as conserving important resources. Julie, quick question. Who the heck do I see to get answers? I've gone through probably 20 plus agencies, commission, through Mr. Tebbett's office. Uh, Ms. Bird's here, she's been probably as helpful as anybody out there. But I just, I'm back 360 degrees to Shannon Morrison, the one that originally said we're in violation of wetlands. I am getting nowhere. It's four and a half months, you guys. If I ran my business like that, I'd be out of business in a week. And yet, we're paying this big money to the state employees, and yet we're getting no results as taxpayers that are financing these people. Something's got to be done, very, very seriously done. And there is a lot of us, a lot of us, that are just getting fed up with this wetland. It's such a gray area. And I appreciate the, the frustration I have to get at, but I'm damn mad today, I'll be honest with you, real mad. We, I can follow. Who do up. I see? <laughs> I can follow up with you offline. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, we'd like to start the public comment portion to make sure that everybody who's planned for a two-hour meeting has an opportunity to um, do the comments. Uh, if you um, have questions within your comments, we will. We can do one of two things, it will be up to you. We can either try to answer your question during your five minute comment period, or we'll take note of them and we will issue, and regardless, we will um, be issuing a response to questions that may come up in, during your comments. So everybody has their, their five minutes um, at a minimum, at a maximum to use now so we can get through the list. And there may be time at the end to take additional questions. So with that, I don't know do, how many. Do, do you have a question about the public comment period? No, I wanted to public comment. OK, we have a list of what we plan to do. Did you sign up to comment? Did you sign the, the comment sign up? I should be on there. OK, there you are. Yep, your number um, 18. And then I believe we have some people perhaps online. OK. All right, well, we have an online audience as well. So they had the opportunity to um, 
take part in the public comment period online and we don't have anybody who's asked to so we should be able to um, get through this five minute per person comment period um, before noon and maybe open it up to some more questions so the first um, the first individual to um, sign up for comment is James Maroney uh, you can stay where you are stand or sit um, and Emily has offered to help us keep track of our time we don't want to be Appearing to be rude to you, but we are trying to, you know, make sure everybody has some equal time. Thank you. My uh, my questions have to do with uh, Act uh, or, uh, S96, um, uh, at the beginning of, of which, uh, in the definitions section, uh, the word secretary is not uh, defined. But would that be you, or would um, that be? There are five Secretary Moore. secretaries. <laughs> I, I believe that is in Title 10. S96 uh, works in Title 10, so I would be the secretary. You are the secretary. Okay, yes. then I will uh, direct my questions to you. Uh, on page uh, 23, I'm sorry, on page 3, uh, the, the Act refers to uh, targets. Um, and it's my understanding that, um, I understand that the target has to do with the TMDL. And it's my understanding that, that, that the TMDL for agriculture is, is um, 59%, am I correct? I believe lake-wide, yes. Right. Um, uh, my next question is um, the definition of clean water service provider, which is not really uh, given here. Um, can you explain who is eligible to be, or who or what entity is eligible to be a clean water service provider? Is that, does that have to be an NGO? Does that have to be a, um, a, a what? So the, uh, we haven't prescribed what type of entity could be a clean water service provider. We're in the process of, of developing a request for proposals that will be published broadly. And uh, any entity that with an interest is encouraged to apply, there will be constraints on the amount of money um, from that the clean water service provider can use for their administrative services. Okay. Um, but that's a work in On page six, um, uh, there is a there's the word person used with respect. If a person is proposing a clean water project, would that imply that a person might be eligible? As a clean water service provider? Yes. Assuming they meet the criteria. OK, thank you. Um, uh, on page four, the, <coughs> the, the, the state is going to do an analysis of what needs to be done in, in various sections. And I'm quite, quite interested to know it says for Lake Champlain, not later than November 21. And f uh, for Lake Memphremega, uh, uh, 2022 and um, to 2023 for Lake Carmine. Uh, why so slow? Um, I mean, we've been at this for 50 some odd years. Don't we know what is required? So this is setting the non-regulatory targets by sector and we have not done that analysis yet. I think mm -hmm. it's important to keep in mind that the work of the clean water service providers is only is limited to the work that isn't required by another regulatory program. So okay. it's about a third of the overall okay. reductions. My next question is for Secretary Tibbetts. Uh, Secretary Tibbetts, do you believe that the state can meet, uh, has a plan uh, uh, to meet a 59% reduction in agriculture's contribution? Uh, and what will it be? That is certainly the goal, and I know all partners, both uh, the agriculture agency, farmers, conservation groups, USDA, are all focused on that, and the goal is to reach that, um, and we are all in on that to reach that goal. Do you, do you believe that, uh, that that target, which is huge, can be met uh, and still uh, uh, support uh, the uh, uh, conventional paradigm? But what do you mean by conventional paradigm? Conventional farming. Conventional. Conventional farming is the cause of, of, of uh, the, the 45 percent or whatever it is that, is, that agric agriculture is contributing from. Can we still maintain the conventional paradigm? I would, su I would suggest that we're going to have all uh, forms and types of farming. We're going to have conventional. We're going to have organic. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, going to, we're going to lose farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are, we are, all those factors have to play a role in meeting our goals. Mm -hmm. It can't be just one sector. It has to be all people in and all conventions are farming in. Uh, do you, one more question for you, Secretary Jevitz. Uh, do, you, do you believe that Norman Borlaug uh, 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 disproved the Malthusian prophecy or proved it? <laughs> 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 No more questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we have Michael Colby. Um, 
Hi there. Hi there. My name is Michael Sorry. Colby. Um, I'm with uh, Regeneration Vermont, and I think first of all, we, we all have to we have to put a spotlight on Doug Hopper's report and, and put all of this into context. And let me just quote from Doug Hopper's report, who did an audit of all of our clean water spending. And he said, 95% of all state clean water expenditures do not yield any measurable results. 95% 90, of all state clean water expenditures do not yield any measurable results. And, th and this project, this budget, is more of the same. It's ignoring the main problem, which is the kind of agriculture that we are promoting in this state. Confinement, concentrated animal feeding operations. That's what's causing the problem. We've got about $26 million budgeted to try to clean up that mess. The Agency of Agriculture in the state has a budget of about $25 million. What are they doing primarily? They're promoting and protecting and enabling that pollution to continue. And then we're gonna chip in $26 million here to try to clean up what the Agency of Ag is enabling mm -hmm. year after year after year. It's not working for any of us, and yet we continue down this same road. The, the, the auditor of accounts is saying, this is not working. The farmers are saying, this is not working. They're getting paid less than the cost of production. Do you know what this budget is? You know, the Cabot Creamery and Ben and Jerry's are making about a billion dollars each in sales. A billion dollars. The amount of money we're spending to clean up their messes is about 1.3% of their annual sales. So they're taking billions of dollars, billions, from our land, from our farmers, from our taxpayers. Where is Ben and Jerry's and Cabot in, in the funding mechanism? Nowhere. Their lobbyists got them out of paying for all this. We're sending billions to Unilever in London. We're sending billions to, Cal to Agamart in Massachusetts, and yet, we're cleaning up their messes. We're caught with the bill. And the worst thing is the plan is ridiculous. It's the same thing. We hear Laura, we hear Anson talk about best management practices and required agricultural practices. Well, let's ask them. How many exemptions did they give farmers in this state last year to break those? I know of at least 70. 70 times, at least, that I know of and I have to file FOIAs all the time just to get this data, where this agency has told farmers, go ahead, spread manure on snow. It's okay. We don't see that. We don't see that. Go ahead. You're struggling. Anson, you said you provided farmers a blanket excuse to spread manure on snow, which is just a big, big no-no. Huge. You don't do it. And where does that go? It melts. It goes into the waterway. <clears throat> you said you approved that because the farmers were hurting economically. Wow, talk about just keeping the crazy wheel going. We have to have money in this program to transition these farmers away from this kind of agriculture or we're losing. We're losing for farmers, we're losing for taxpayers, we're losing for migrant workers. Are we even gonna talk about that boogeyman? Do you have 1,500 Migrant laborers are working in the shadows in this state, making have no protections for worker protections. And you know what the state did? They said, let Ben and Jerry's come up with a program to protect them. Really? Really? New York State at least had the political gumption and the humanity to pass laws to protect these people. You pass the buck. Ben and Jerry's will take care of those workers, and we know how that's working out. It's just a publicity stunt. We have to focus on transitioning the farmers that are causing the problem. There are about 33 farmers in this state with more than 700 cows, capos. It's the largest growth sector in, in farming and dairy, the big ones. We have the same amount of cows as small guys. What, we lose 8% last year, Anson, statewide? Probably <clears throat> close to 10. Close to 10%. So what, are you just cheering them as they go over the cliff? <clears throat> keep going, keep going. Enough. We need a plan for transition. We need to listen to what Doug Hoffer said. This is, this is putting money through a shredder. Absolutely through a shredder. I don't know how much, am I out of time? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. You know what, let me just say, there are a lot of people in this room. I've been in their living room, from Carmi to Button Bay, 
and my I tip my hat for you to being here, and my heart breaks for you. They're, they they bought their land, they lived in their place because they love water. They love water resources. They love this state. They didn't want this battle. It came washing up on their shores and into their lives. Listen to them, respect them, and do something for them. Thank you, Mr. Up today, and next up we have uh, Sylvia Knight. <laughs> Sylvia Knight, I live in Burlington. I lived for about 26 years in Charlotte. <clears throat> Everything on earth is connected. What we do to the land, we do to ourselves. What we do to the land also goes into the water. Until we stop using poisons on the land, we cannot have clean water. We're putting tons of glyphosate, tons of atrazine, tons of metolachlor on our land in the Champlain Valley every year, not just 10 years, every year. This model of agriculture does not work. It's poisoning us. It's doubtful. I learned this year that I received additional information this year, I should say, because I've heard of this problem before, that, that Roundup contains phosphorus and leaves phosphorus on the ground and puts it into the water. We have tons of phosphorus going into our water from our agricultural practices. Let me see, somewhere I have, okay. 2012, more than 27.8 tons of glyphosate were poured onto Vermont land with a loading of five tons of phosphorus. This has been completely ignored in this whole discussion. In 2016, approximately 49.3 tons <laughs> of glyphosate were used on Vermont land with a loading of nine tons of phosphorus. We can't ignore that. We can't ignore that. I hear nothing about this in, in this whole discussion. It's being completely ignored. It is significant. It is not not to be ignored. So I'm doubtful that we can meet the TMDL without stopping the use of Roundup. Now we have GMO corn all over the place. So I think that this looks, forces us to look at the model of agriculture that we are supporting in this program. So our state needs to embrace a different paradigm. We need to embrace a paradigm a regenerative, organic agriculture and use the dollars in this budget toward that purpose. I'm a taxpayer. I'm looking for change in this program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, next have Pete Zimmerman. Hi. Hi. I'm Pete Zimmerman. I, my home is on Button Bay, uh, just about a mile south of the state park. I would want to preface by saying that my family and my wife's family have been involved in uh, farming and forestry for generations, so I am not anti-farmer. Um, one thing that's interesting is talking about paradigms. 
conventional farming. Well, what I think many people are talking about with conventional farming is a pretty modern uh, evolution. Um, we didn't have that form of conventional farming a few years ago. Um, this in extremely intensive farming, which I don't think anybody can, can deny is causing much of the problem. I live on Lake Champlain, and the condition of the lake is a scandal. People are afraid to go in the water. Animals are dying from drinking the water. Pets down the lake. Lady lost two dogs from drinking the water. Um, it's a scandal. And what I've heard today is a parade of cheerleaders for how we're going to help the farmer. Uh, m my understanding is that just up the lake from us, we have a new manure pond being created with significant subsidies. Uh, that's going to contain some manure for a little while, but it's then going to get spread back on the fields, and it's going to get <clears> right back into the lake. Same, all it does is defer some of the problem for a little while. What? I'll give you another example. Um, we have farmland directly behind us where the farmer has recently put in tile drainage and has recently eliminated the buffer zone between his, uh, his cropped fields and the drainage ditch. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my neighbors has taken samples of what's coming directly out of the culvert. It's poison. That goes into the drainage ditch, drops into the stream, goes directly into the lake. It's poison. What I've heard is all cheerleading for agriculture. I have not heard anything discussed about enforcement of rules and laws that we already have. Through the 1960s and into the 70s, we had problems with air pollution and industrial pollution. A hue and cry eventually ensued, and a lot has been done to clean up our air pollution and the industrial pollution that used to pour into our waterways. What's happening now is we're getting the same form of pollution coming from agriculture. Not the same form, but an equivalent style of pollution. And it's coming from agriculture. And unless practices change, and unless the people who are pouring the pollution into our streams and lakes are held accountable, that's not going to change. I understand it's a worldwide problem. Agricultural practices are changing worldwide. But we can't just shrug our shoulders and say, that's the way it is, and allow the lake and all of our streams, precious natural resources, to simply become cesspools. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. staff signed in, so I'm uh, thinking it was a sign-in sheet, so I'm going to skip through. And, um, the next public comment, I believe, is from Andrea Engelhart. Hi, I'm from Lake Carmine, and we are the one and only Lake in Crisis, and we appreciate that designation, and we appreciate all the work people have done to help our lake. Gobs of money, the aeration system, a million and a half. Then we also had the fixing of the failed septic system at our own state park. That was substantial amount of money. And that manure was uh, used to be spread on the state park on lands. And that practice has stopped. So we put, a l and agriculture, there's been a lot of help for farmers with all the cover cropping and things like that, which we've seen the change in the landscape all of which we appreciate. So we put a lot of tax money into helping Lake Karma. But this summer, with our lake in crisis, biking along a little dirt road, Hammond Shore, which is right along the lake shore, manure is being spread. And it probably is meeting the requirements of agriculture, the rules, but it doesn't make sense. We spent a couple of million dollars just recently to help the lake, and we're spreading manure not up against the shore, but 10 feet from a dirt road 
50 feet from the cottage and I don't know, 100 feet from the lakeshore. So it seems counterproductive. So I'm asking that reconsideration. Let's perhaps try and banning manure spreading in this lake in crisis watershed and try and help the lake heal and see if our phosphorus numbers come down. The last I heard, they haven't come down much despite all of the money spent. So that shouldn't be too expensive. We'd have to help the farmers do something else with their manure. We understand it has to go somewhere, but please don't put it in the watershed. We spent so much money helping it just until the lake heals a little bit and um, changes can happen in agriculture. So thanks for our efforts, but it's still blooming. We were there last week. We have Sayana back here blooming now. Thank you. <coughs> uh, Roy Shuck? No, Shea. Shea, I'm sorry. Now, hi, everybody. My name is Roy Shea, and I live in Ferrisburg. Um, I'm not an eloquent speaker. I'm not an accomplished speaker. And it might be a little bit difficult for me to disguise my frustration, my disgust. The lake, Lake Champlain, is a disgrace. Make no mistake about it. Little history lesson. July 23rd, 1609, Samuel de Champlain discovered this lake. He had a Jesuit missionary priest with him that recorded that you could see 60 feet down. Think about that. That's how pure and clear the lake was. Nowadays, on the Vermont side, you're lucky if you can see six feet down. And on some days, you're lucky if you put your hand in you, six inches, you won't be able to see it. You, the Vermont government, you let this happen to this lake. That is a crime. And an even more crime is that you continue to let it happen. Talk to our legislators, excuse me, they're totally intimidated by this sacred Department of Agriculture that allows these industrial farms to desecrate our lake. You let poison, poison is defined as a substance that does harm, illness, or kills a living organism. Mm -hmm. Myself and a neighbor have <laughs> independently taken samples of point sources from the farms. E. coli. Over 25,000 parts per million, off the charts. E. coli is a poison that the Department of Agriculture says, oh, they're using good farming practices. Well, your good farming practices don't do anything for the health of the lake. And more so, you're letting poison go into our drinking water. OK? How long is it before this poison leaches into residential wells? Then you're going to have a problem and you continue to let it happen. I don't know what the answer is. You favor the agriculture, large agriculture farms over the lake. The lake that could be a huge source of revenue for this state, for this industrial operation called the dairy in industry that contributes less than 2% to the GDP of the lake, but for some reason is sacred. Oh, the Department of Agriculture says we, we have fines that, we'll, that we will give the, uh, the farms if they disobey or we find an infraction. Are you kidding? A $5,000 fine is well worth the cost of the infraction. You don't do anything for the lake. You really don't. I'm mad. I'm mad as hell. And I'm going to tell you something. Our influence is spreading. We're talking to more and more people. We're having more and more meetings. And we're educating them on what is going on. What this is, what is happening to our water. And you're letting it happen. So thank you. Thank you. Robert Wright. Well, let's see. Yeah, let's see. I've lived most, I guess, 70 to 78 years in Vermont. And uh, uh, I love the place. And I, too, am irate at what I see happening to our lake. 
I just make me so angry I can hardly speak. Where is the money to help farmers transition away from practices that damage the lake? Where is the money to help them stop putting phosphorus-bearing compounds into it? Phosphorus-bearing fertilizer, phosphorus-bearing pesticides. Where is the, there is money, I see, to try to control and constrain some of the runoff that's out there now. Is it helping very much? It doesn't seem to be. Let's stop putting more and more and more in. Let's restrain the, uh, and find ways to uh, go back on the large farm, industrial farm uh, mode of farming. That's what's killing the lake. I would just like to add my voice to all the other comments that I've heard recently about that. Thank you, sir. Uh, Evan Markowski. 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 Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm from Panton. Um, I reiterate things that Michael said and James said and my other neighbors uh, in the Panton area about sort of the out of hand nature that we see conventional industrial dairy to be. And um, it paints a very different picture from how we hear it represented and things under control with our best practices in place. Um, it's a runaway ship. It's not under control. Um, and I would like to, I can, without going too far into, into a broader view, I, we had a meeting at Panton to address a manure spill that I actually photographed, videoed, and it got some airtime with BPR and it raised, some, uh, raised the issue. Um, and that issue is, to, to hone in on one thing, the, the exemptions that happened. Michael talked about the 70 or so exemptions that happened. And we can make excuses that it was a, this is a seasonal thing and the weather did its thing. The weather always does its thing. There's always going to be a weather incident. We, we can't fall back on that excuse time and again. Um, the, the situation that I photographed, um, I think, highlights it because it shows the temporary status that when you spread on snow, and you spread on frozen ground, um, in any situation, it is, it, is, it is inevitable that it's going to go to the lake. And at our Panton Town meeting, I tried to, to get an understanding, would the Agency of Agriculture just ban the practice? We, in my view, would be better off having a manure pit overflow so that we can pinpoint on what farm that was and we can hold that farm accountable, rather than spread it over the landscape where no one's going to see it and pretend it doesn't happen. This, the farm, I wasn't able to get an answer during the meeting from, from Laura, um, but the Addison Independent did a reporting on it, and the farm spread, uh, the, the farm was giving a verbal permission, I believe, of 104,000 gallons of manure they could spread, which was reported as five days worth of manure. Five days of manure on a lakeshore farm. Um, the farm spread 540,000 gallons, um, which also affected Dead Creek. Um, so if the state gave verbal permission of 100 and some odd gallons of manure, to me, that's an incrimination of your department, that you are OK with 100,000 gallons of manure going into the lake. Because if you're putting it on snow, if you're putting it on frozen ground, it's going to make its way to the lake. And anyone wants to respond to that is telling me how it is not an inevitability. I'm, I'm open to hear that. Reed Hampton. I, uh, I live on uh, Button Bay, right adjacent to the state park. Uh, last week we had a huge algae outbreak that covered the whole bay pretty much. Um, I think the root of the problem really is why did the state legislature, in all of its wisdom, make the Agency of Agriculture self-policing? As somebody who's started a business with two people and ended up with 225. I've been through Act 250 12 times. Mm -hmm. I've worked with the DEC and everybody, and I believe in doing stuff the right way. But this is just horrendous. They are, I have seen in the five years that I've lived there, tons of trees come down, a lot of sculpting of the land. Where this discharge that Evan took was right next to my property, which is just a small swale, which has a five-foot culvert underneath the road, 
followed by another four foot culvert just around the corner. And all of this water goes down into a swamp and then comes down right into the bay. It just big chunks of bloom for a week. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Ernest and Donna Ray, do that, or do you want to, who wants to start? No, Ernest and Donna Ray? I have nothing to say. Ernest? <laughs> that's why I'm proud. Ernie Angle's heart, I am uh, Camp Holder and Lake Carmine, and also a member of the Board of Directors of the Campus Association. And I want to first appreciate uh, what the state has done for us. I made a commitment to and Followed through and installed this generation system <coughs> in Lake Carmi. As I understand it, it's one of the few in the country. Um, we have always thought of Lake Carmi in the vein of having this generation system as sort of a laboratory, and our motto kind of was if the state can't fix a small, defined lake like Lake Carmi, um, what was us? Um, so they are, we've noticed a lot, that my wife mentioned, a lot of farming practices that have changed on and around the shore, which is helpful, we believe. Uh, anyway, and I, my interest today, and I, I support a lot of the statements made today relating to the, to the dairy industry in Vermont, and I'm looking to you folks and others try to um, improve or get away from dairy farming. I used to believe that uh, there was, we had too many cows on the car line, and that's the problem. Uh, I'm, I'm changing my view a little bit in that I know that there is a lot of, uh, a lot of acreage in the Lake car line, which is uh, an impaired lake, obviously, a lake in crisis. And it's not generated on farms in our watershed, but it's imported in from uh, other farms outside of Lake Parma. That's what I spoke in from the Senate Ag Committee and others last fall. I mentioned I thought it was unusual that if you have a lake that is impaired, why allow manure to be imported into that impaired body of water? But anyway. My main focus today, and I just want to talk about is, I'm curious as to how, what mechanism or what data is going to be available as we go forward, say on an annual basis, so we can track how Lake Carmi is doing. Uh, in other words, we have a model that's, I assume, it's the MDL is this now, and every year it's projected to be this based on all the factors that go into modeling. And I would I would hope that an RFA or whoever needs to provide the input could give us on an annual basis what the model says and what the actual result is in the field so that we can tell people on the lake and perhaps other places this is improving. The phosphorus load in the lake is decreasing. I think that's very really important. Just straightforward field data to support to support that. So I'm not quite sure how at some point anyone is going to say, okay, Lake Carmine now meets the standards of a clear water, a clear water water. I'm not sure how that you know, that's working. Anyway, please develop some sort of straightforward format so we can you know what's happening. There are a lot of different, a lot of different information that could go along with that. The number of acres changing, the MPs, <coughs> reduction of manure on an annual basis coming into the watershed. There needs to be clear information at the end of whatever the TMBO is, in 2023. Is that? There needs to be clear information because we're, we're told that their best management practices are being used. And we have the temporary, the uh, aeration system is a temporary. 
a temporary stopgap measure that some of the legislators call a band regardless. We'll see how that goes over the years. But we need to know at the end of that period whether or not the TMDO is reached. And if it's not, then we have to go back and say, the BMPs, the practices, or the whole concept of their environment is not workable. Thank you. Uh, we have Ernest Wright. I already made Ernest. my comment. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Alfred Cumming. Alfred Cumming. Let's take it back. Robert Cormier. <coughs> Hi, I'm Robert Cormier from Franklin, Vermont. I'm a board of directors on the Lake Carmine watershed. And now, first of all, thank you all for coming here to this. And it's us, the people in this room, that are going to make this happen and make the changes. And we've got to start working together. What's fascinating here is there's people that suddenly have the names are like it's an epiphany. It's like, oh, I read your comments on this article, especially you, sir. And it's, you know, we are the ones that are going to work and we're going to fix this. I'm from Massachusetts. When you walk into the state house in Massachusetts, you touch the sacred cow, the sacred cod. Now, the sacred cod hasn't been caught in Massachusetts since probably about the 1950s. And part of the thing is that we're misinterpreting the statue on top of the state house. It's not about the, it's, it's agriculture. We've got to start to pivot to a different crop right here. Ag is not our problem in this state. If you re talk about the reoccurring theme it's have, it's dairy. It's dairy waste. That is our biggest thing. It's waste quality waste. And how do we start to pivot? We are stuck in this rut of dairy, yet the country is starting to go down on dairy consumption. The millennials are driving the food train right now, yet we are continuously feeding them dairy. And guess what they don't do? They don't drink milk. They don't eat Vermont cheese. Cabot cheese, just because it won an award in 1898, it's garbage. It's the Velveeta of cheddar cheese. <laughs> All right? Millennials don't eat cabbage cheese. They eat high-end cheeses from small dairies, from small dairy operations. And that's what they owe. they got to get that kind of go there. What this budget is, it's a waste of money. It's $36 million. If we took that $36 million and invested it in global foundries, Along with the agricultural budget, we'd probably make a billion dollars in profit, which we could tax at 10%, make $100 million. We're already in the profit range right there. We've got to look at what we're doing with the money, and we've got to look at what we can do to stop things for free. And what the biggest thing is to stop things for free is the reoccurring theme. You've got to stop the spreading, and it's the concentration spreading. I mean, we're spreading. We have a leaking crisis bill. Yet they're spreading, they're saturating right up on the lake that you have a lake in crisis. That's the, the biggest irony that we have. I mean, the, talk about insanity. I mean, it's absolutely crazy what we're doing right there. What I call it is state sponsored pollution. The state is encouraging them to pollute. We're seeing it with spreading on snow, we're seeing it with leaky pits. We're seeing it with every single thing that they do. You know, you want to stop the things, you want to stop this. The biggest thing that we need to do is two things. You gotta get water out of ag. Water, this, they get the, the fox guarding the hen house. Their mission, which is right, is to encourage agriculture. So what happens is they do something wrong, they fix it. That's their job, that's what they do. They encourage agriculture. You get water out of ag, and you put teeth in deck with water, it's gonna start solving this. And you stop blaming everybody, and you start blaming the point sources. The point sources that we know is not the guy growing tomatoes. It's not the guy trying to grow hemp. It's the giant CAFO that my saying is we have the wrong people growing the wrong food in the wrong places. So it's the giant apathetic CAFO that is on the river that is trying, that is a business. And how do you know it's a business? They put LLC on their trucks. They advertise the fact that we're a corporation. This is what corporations look like in Vermont. It's not Enron. 
It's not Ford Motor Company. It's the Pleasant Valley Farm down the road with LLC on it that's polluting and contaminating everything that we have. Ugh. I'm not anti-farming. I'm anti women. I'm anti-pollution. And that's what I think the both of us are. And these people are going around and they're polluting. And we've got to stop that. We've got to start to pivot out of dairy. At some point in time, <coughs> farming of agriculture, I know you're going to be having it at the water coolers conversations. They're starting to pivot out of dairy. What next do we go into? People aren't drinking dairy, they're not going down, not drinking meat anymore. We have to start having hard conversations with the cities. They're a big problem too. Lake Carmine, it's ag. Burlington, ugh, it's probably Burlington itself. And until you start going to them like they did in Boston, guess what, Boston? You've got to buy a four, mil a $4 billion sewer treatment system in 1993. That's coming here. You have to have those hard, honest conversations. But we're getting ready to go into a data fight. If we don't start working together, we don't start sharing our data with one another, we're not going to solve the problem. They're not going to solve the problem up there. We're going to solve the problem, working together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Judith McLaughlin? Yes. Sure. Um, I'm from Lake Carmi also. And I want to caveat, I want to say something with my other Lake Carmi colleagues who thanked you for doing what's been done up at Lake Carmi. But I will caveat that with, it wasn't without a fight. You guys fought us the entire way and we had to go ugly. And you even brought up to armed guards to one of our TMDL meetings because, I don't know, somebody thought we were going to, I don't know, rebel or something when we were just simply angry. So that is Lake Carmi and what you've done, and it wasn't without a fight. So my point is we're not done fighting yet. Just simply because that aeration system went in, we're now seeing it's kind of like, a, oh, job done, let's focus elsewhere. So the lake in crisis bill put Lake Carmi as a lake in crisis because it did have organized people who were willing to stand up and work hard. I mean, this is a full-time job fighting for water cleanliness in the state of Vermont. It's a full-time job for people. Mm -hmm. So now we have, we worked hard, we got the lake in crisis bill. The secretary was supposed to, you know, look at what we should do. And here's our answer. 2021, you're basically telling us that there's no such thing as a lake in crisis, and we don't need to put any specific monies dedicated to that lake in crisis, but go fight for it all over again. You want to see us fight for clean water up at that lake? You ain't seen nothing yet, because we're committed. We are committed. We're going to talk to Button Bay. We're going to talk to all these people. And we're going to come back. And you have to hear the message. It isn't working. What you're doing isn't working. So on Lake Carmi, after we're declared the lake in crisis, and you put in the aeration system for a million dollars, you know what the installer told you? I went to every meeting. It's not going to work if you don't stop the flow. It's not going to work if you don't stop the flow. He said as soon as you turn it off, it's going to stop working. Well, it's been breaking down. Take it. That's a test. We understand that. But I sat there and watched two weeks ago. <coughs> while if I check the source, it may be that illegal CAFO on Potato Hill Road that we told you about two years ago that you didn't know was happening. And I believe you're now in court with it, correct? Potato Hill Farm Road, you're in court trying to figure out what it is because it was built without any oversight. They came in and I would swear a hundred, up to 100,000 gallons dumped on the um, eastern shore of a lake in crisis. Where is the sense in that? It could have been a simple BMP, uh, ban manure, because that's where we're heading now. Am I right? We're all heading. Ban manure in a lake in crisis. Or we're going to head uh, to another solution, which is how about putting money in 8-alpha, put money into a lake in crisis bill, and maybe we can go to the landowners who are renting out their land to be a absentee landlords, to be a manure dump, 
Right. Maybe we can talk to the landlords and say, hey, how about leasing the land to us and we'll turn it into a pollinator field. It's simple, but we can't because now we have to go and spend all of our time competing for the few dollars that you're putting towards, well, the no dollars that you're putting towards the lake in crisis. So my point is, please go back and rethink that and use the assets that you have because we do have organized groups. We have the watershed, we have LCCA, we're working with the Farmers Watershed Alliance, we're working with everybody, but we're a lake in crisis and now we have to go back to the drawing board and get angry again and start calling you guys out for the jobs that you're not doing. So, I don't know, I'm not sure where we're going. It's a simple solution. If it's a lake in crisis, put money towards it. Thank you. Thank you. Jess Buckley. Hi, good morning. Um, first, I want to thank you all for uh, your efforts in negotiating this budget. Um, I work for the conservation districts as ag program manager. Um, and I want to also highlight that we appreciate seeing the funding come through the FAP program to uh, support rotational grazing, which we think keeping uh, landing, <coughs> excuse me, keeping landing grass is an important practice. Um, so thank you for including that in the ag budget. Um, we also want to say that we appreciate the, the block grants. Um, that model of providing funding reduces the administrative overhead of the granting processes. So we want to support you um, in doing that process and, and we appreciate that process and would like to advocate to continue that. Um, and let's see, the energy in here is really intense. <laughs> it's, really, it's really great to hear everybody's perspective, everybody's here interested in uh, reducing phosphorus loading in the lake, and it's a big task. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that we're all doing our best, um, and <coughs> that's all I have to say. Thank you. Did I miss anybody, because we are at the end of the... Jennifer Decker. Okay, Jennifer, why don't you go ahead? I think you may have come in late and missed the sheet, which is fine. Okay. Um, I'm here to stand for water that is healthy for all of life. I really appreciate everybody's comments very much. Um, I wanted to just say that um, in addition to all the concerns that have been raised here today that um, there's PFAS laden firefighting foam being used at the Burlington Airport due to the military uses. <coughs> Um, the uh, F-35 plane is going to uh, add additional uh, pollution to our region, uh, so many of us are working to ban that. Um, the uh, PF PFOA, PFOS are forever chemicals that don't break down in the environment. They're associated with many cancers, infertility and miscarriages. Um, immune system, prenatal, and early childhood developmental disorders. Um, curious, um, uh, if you can think of someone you know um, who has a child who has a developmental disorder, can you think of a child uh, or an adult who has cancer? Can you think of someone you know who has a neurological condition that's developed and they don't know where it came from, maybe a, a sort of a mystery illness. Can you think of someone with Crohn's disease? Can you think of someone who has epilepsy? My niece grew up in the old north end of Burlington where she was exposed to high levels of lead. She then moved and lived in Addison County where she was an outdoor active kid. We spent a lot of time in the water and we spent a lot of time eating really great local Vermont produced food. Then my niece moved uh, not far from the Burlington Airport where we now know these firefighting foams were used. Then she developed epilepsy. So my question here is, what is the cost of not doing enough? Are we considering all the costs of not doing enough? So 
I'm here to speak for the children. I have friends who have enrolled their kids in camp this summer, and the camps just routinely take them into um, Lake Champlain. I used to swim in Lake Champlain, but I won't swim there anymore. I drive to the Waterbury Reservoir, and I swim there all the time. Um, but I've thought a lot this summer about giving that up because I don't want to make the drive and I don't want to add anything more to the load that the next generations are carrying. We have a whole generation that's inspired right now to take care of the earth, to end <coughs> climate change, and to clean up the beautiful world that we all share. We could take whatever money and resources we have and we could pay people to do the work to clean our really incredibly beautiful state. Some people might be paid to help uphold some of the obstacles to change. Please try not to be one of those people. I learned recently that there are some uh, regulations at the federal level and such that make it hard for people to stand up and say, we're going to change things here on the local level. That sounds like a really great excuse to me for the peaceful political revolution that we know that Vermont stands for. We can't uphold human laws that contradict good science. What we invest in, we get back in return. I would love to see the next generation inspired by steps that start here today. And I would love to be a part of the change. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank, thank all of you. Um, yes. Oh, there's one more. I'm sorry. Hi. Um, my name is Jane Clifford, and I actually am a dairy farmer in Starksboro, Vermont. Um, my husband and I own and operate Clifford Farm. It's been in my husband's family since 1793. It is the longest <coughs> continuous dairy farm in the state. I'm very proud of our farm. We work very hard to meet the regulations. We work very hard to follow the rules. And yes, there are some people that in every walk of life that don't follow the rules. We also own a piece of property um, in Hinesburg on Lake Iroquois, um, small little lake. This year, it is so infested with milfoil and is so cloudy, swimming is, is not an option. There is not a farm. There is not an animal. There is not manure being spread within a very large radius of that little lake. But there is a significant amount of dirt road runoff. There's a significant amount of camps that have not upgraded their septic systems. The lake, Lake Champlain, the watershed, it's all of us. We all have a responsibility to do the right thing. But I'm disappointed that you think it's okay to always point the finger at me on my farm and say, it's, you have to stop it. You have to stop milking cows. You have to stop spreading manure. You have to stop. 
you want us to stop producing a high quality product that we take pride in. My livelihood, we employ seven people full and part time. My husband works seven days a week, 365 days a year. He loves it, he's dedicated to it. And so when I sit here and hear that, just get rid of them, just tell them to change and do something else, I'm very insulted. I agree that it is a problem, and I agree that not everyone is doing the right thing. But to totally discount an industry that definitely is the backbone of this state. Vermont is the most dependent dairy state in the country. $3 million a day of new money from selling dairy products. Yes, the fluid consumption is down. Consumption of cheese, consumption of soft dairy products is up considerably. Does this country make too much milk? Absolutely. And do we need to do something about it? We are in the process right now of working on creating a growth management system. But again, to discount people. I'm a person. I love what I do. And I'm really proud of it. And again, all of us have a responsibility. Thank you. OK, that concludes the um, public comment portion of the meeting. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out and being heard and taking part in this discussion and this very civil and passionate um, uh, discourse. That's what Vermont is about. That's why we're here. And we, I really appreciated hearing from every one of you. I also want to tell the staff who presented today and who have worked very hard on this budget to balance all of these competing pressures and and interest. Um, I want to thank them for the work that they did to pull together the budget that serves this board and to pull together this hearing. And I will, this, these comments will have been recorded. They will be um, posted. Uh, and once the public comment period is over in September, there's still time to comment online uh, and make yourselves heard. And we will take everything into consideration as we move forward on finalizing a budget this fall. So with that, I'd just like to open it up to anyone on the board who um, has anything to add. <laughs> I do have uh, one brief question on what happens next. I'm Jeff Batista from the auditor's office. Um, how does this public consultation event, other comments, and uh, the survey that's still out <coughs> going to formally factor into the decision-making process for the project coming up? So what, what will happen is that all of the comments will be pulled together in um, what is a very lengthy but in detailed um, document for the board and for the public. They will all be posted. And we will draw our conclusions from you know, the, the comments that, that we receive in this hearing um, into our final decision making. And you know, we've heard a lot today. We've heard a lot of opinions on where we might want to shift some funding. And we'll be taking all of that into account. And we will then um, finalize the budget. I believe by statute, the budget is presented to the Secretary of Administration, that is me, who um, is responsible for presenting the governor with his proposed budget for um, final development. And then it will go to the legislature. There will be another round of hearings on, on this budget and um, the rest of the governor's proposed budget and, and competing um, proposals from the legislature and the public at the legislature. And at some point, the legislature will decide um, what the final budget bill will look like, and it will pass through. I just that wanted process. to ask: um, Is there ever a time when we could have this meeting, like on a weekend Saturday, yes. because a lot more people could fund, yeah. could come to this, if you would allow that? Yeah. So it certainly is is something that we should consider. Yes, and and I think with our process, we may have 
plenty of time to do that before the, um, the final budget meeting of the board. And this, what future points will the public have input beyond the comments today? The, every meeting of, of the board, the Clean Water Board, is public, and we post um, and publicize the meetings on the website. Uh, and so there's always time at the end of those meetings if you want to have formal discourse with the board, and that's available. Mm -hmm. so, just, thank you. Um, we will be sending out uh, updates at every step of the budget process to our stakeholder email list. If you haven't signed up for it, there is a sign-up sheet right outside, and that's a great way to hear about all these opportunities to to come to board meetings, to participate in these hearings, and the online questionnaire. Are we considered stakeholders? Yes, absolutely. All of you are considered stakeholders, and we really appreciate Let's start. your participation. Thank you. Of course, you're all stakeholders. Appreciate it. So with that, um, we will we'll adjourn, and thank you again very much for coming out. <laughs>